Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I had to say to my friend to my right that um, there's one thing is guaranteed that I'm a creature of habit. So here I am after lunch on the second day, speaking in my accustomed slot, despite the variations in um, um, variations in delivery today. So, Mr. Speaker. Um, gives me great um, pleasure to offer a few comments on the estimates before us. Mr. Speaker, um, from time to time, I do listen to the statements made in the public. I do have, um, review and read postings on, on Facebook, and I do go places where you hear debate of one kind or another. And Mr. Speaker, in, in, in the past couple of weeks, in the run-up to this budget, I've had the opportunity to hear statements emanating from the, the opposition. And perhaps what has resonated the most, Mr. Speaker, is the personal assaults on the Minister of Finance, the member for Castries East, and the Prime Minister. And you hear a constant refrain that the government has no plan, the government has no vision. The Minister of Finance does not know what to do. And uh, in Churchillian style, they have even argued that the Minister of Finance <clears throat> and the member for Castries East does not even know what he has done, meaning that he did things but did not know the very consequence or the very act of what he, was done, he had done. And on arrival to this afternoon, a few moments ago, I understood that the leader of the opposition described the budget as a patch-patch budget, or described the government as a patch-patch government. <clears throat> Now, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> budgets have always attracted descriptions over the years. Always attract this descriptions. Some of these descriptions are, are, are famous. And among us in this house, some would remember the famous pronouncement of George R. Lovner describing a Louisy budget as a bikini budget. In other words, um, what the budget hid, I'm using my own language now, <coughs> was fascinating. And what it hid was far removed from what it disclosed. Then too, of course, um, again, George Odlam describing one budget as a better less budget. And that, of course, was made very famous by one of our Calypsonians using that term, my my good friend and St. Lucia's most outstanding Calypsonian, which I'm prepared to defend anytime, anywhere, the invader. And he has used that to great effect in music. And then I remember um, in my own time describing a budget of the former administration when the leader of the opposition, the Minister of Finance, I described his budget as a budget guafal. And of course, I was just telling my good friend that that language came from an, an ordinary citizen of St. Lucia, describing the budget as a budget that had a huge stomach, that all it did was to fill up that stomach, about that, and with every living thing, to consume every living thing in its way, had a huge appetite, but of course, very little to, to come out of it. So when the leader of the opposition says that you're dealing with a patch-patch budget, I mean, I guess he wants to go down in the annals of history as having crafted a term that resonates in time. But you know, the problem is that when you use terms, the terms must somehow resonate with the historical moment. It must capture the historical moment. If people are to latch on to these terms, Mr. Speaker, then somehow the term 
has not only remained in their minds, but described accurately and accurately the circumstances of, of the time. But Mr. Speaker, the problem with that description is that it just does not explain the budget that is before this house. That's the problem. The leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, has a huge difficulty on, difficulty on his hands. And I have to commend the member for Sozel who understood the difficulty and in his own presentation he avoided as best as he could any attempt to criticize the logic, objective, the purpose of the budget. He stayed away but meandered through some inconsequential items in his constituency. That's the route, and no disrespect meant, but that is the route that he took. He avoided it. He avoided confrontation. He avoided replies. He avoided creating any kind of mischief, any kind of speculation. Now, to put it another way, that was his way of denouncing the speech that we heard earlier this afternoon. That was a speech. Well, I, I'm now a deputy speaker and I apply the rules. <laughs> I follow the rules. The rules say that you must use appropriate language to describe members of the House and I will never ever resort to unparliamentary language at this stage. This is an important period of my career. So, <laughs> so, so I will use language that is appropriate to, to, to facilitate the circumstances. So, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the statistics. Mr. Speaker, you have a forecasted growth rate of 6.96%. Now, interestingly, Mr. Speaker, the International Monetary Fund has forecasted a growth rate of 3.2% for 2023. For 2023. And, Mr. Speaker, interestingly, too, that the government of St. Lucia has forecasted a growth rate of 7.3%. For 2024, it's forecasted. The IMF, in turn, forecasts the growth rate at 2.3% a decline. Now, the fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is this. Um, we shall see who is right and who is wrong. But already, you have an indication that what the IMF said was not correct. And I shall come back to that in a minute. But I want to be faithful, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to read out to you the press release, a paragraph of the press release issued by the IMF Executive Board, which incidentally was made available to the Honorable House by the, by the leader of the opposition. So I'm reading from his document, Mr. Speaker. This is what IMF says. The GDP growth projection in 2023 at 3.2% is lower than 2022 as tourism demand continues the recovery and the economy approaches the existing production capacity. Afterwards, it is projected to gradually decline towards a potential rate of 1.5% in the medium term. Annual inflation is projected to remain high at, in 2023 at 4.3% and then decline to around 2% in the medium term. The current account deficit is expected at 0.8% of GDP in 2023, and by all accounts, this is phenomenal because, as I've said before in this house, normally economists expect that the correct that the correct um, the, 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 the the correct percentage of the the current account deficit should be really about just 2.1.5 percent. So the current account deficit is expected at 0.8 percent of GDP in 2023, and is projected to close over the medium term, driven by the continued recovery in tourism. Unquote. That's the IMF in 2024. March 7, 2024. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have read it, but to make a point, that there are people in this house, in this country, who believe that the judgments of the IMF are sacred that the IMF can never be wrong. 
And there are people, I'm, I'm betting you, Mr. Speaker, there are people right now who will not accept the government estimates of the growth rate, but will accept the IMF estimates of the growth rate. That's what's going to happen, Mr. Speaker. But this is a good lesson for all of us around this table and for the citizens at large that we must never ever believe that the IMF is infallible, incapable of errors, or that on the other side, the IMF always gets it right. That's not so. That is not so at all. And so while we await the final judgment, what we do know is that the forecasted growth of the IMF is far below what the government has forecasted, and the government will forecast with a certain degree of certainty and could never make a mistake where the gap between the two as wide as it is without being sure of what it was doing. And when I look back, Mr. Speaker, the crowning growth rate, I think, after independence was a 7.5% achieved by the Labour administration in 2006 when we were booted out of office. That was a crowning growth rate, and I suspect if, of course, we were to benefit then as the former government benefited by the um, recasting of figures of growth rate, etc., then it would have been higher. But my point is, my point is, oh, it's climbed to 10 point something. My point is that this government actually is approaching that growth rate. And um, if it succeeds in eclipsing that growth, growth rate, then, of course, um, the praise and benefit has to go to the government and to the Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, they almost caught up with that, with that growth rate. But let me return to the statistical summary, and they, they need repetition. The current surplus is 156.9 million. Uh, the recurrent surplus of 66 million, and Mr. Speaker, lest you be worried, I'm reading from the budget summary, Mr. Speaker, um, and you can consult your budget summary while I speak. The primary surplus is 104 million. There's a primary balance expressed as a percentage of GDP at 1.5%, and an overall balance as a percentage of GDP of minus 1.6%. Now, may I make a suggestion to the Ministry of Finance as we go through those figures, because you see, when we come to Parliament and cite those figures, unless we spend time to explain those figures, the population don't understand what those figures mean. And perhaps in the notes that they present, they can always take the opportunity to explain to people what these figures mean and what it means for um, the government's management of the fiscal policies of the government. Now the question is, and this is the point. What, how does the opposition handle this? How does the opposition <laughs> react to this? Well, the easiest way is to pretend it don't exist. So in a budget reply, you don't make no reference to it. And it's a tactic that has great value. What you do, in effect, is not to mention those statistics again, argue those statistics so it sticks in people's mind, and then you go in a different direction and mention all other things that are irrelevant. The member for library is looking at me as if I'm preaching something that is, that is wayward. And, but that's a well-known technique of lawyers, among others. That X says why you ignore what X says and go and talk about something else and totally mislead and confound. So that's, that's the position. You can ignore it. But then you cannot argue and say that the economy is on autopilot, perhaps even suggesting that it is guided by an unseen hand, an unknown and unseen hand. Surely you cannot again present an argument in 2024 that the economy has experienced its last burst of growth as it recovers to return to the pre-pandemic pandemic levels. That growth rate was exhausted since last year and the year before. We have gone past that. 
We have gone past that. But even if you want to argue on its merits that that is the case, then how on earth are you going to explain a growth rate of 7.3% in 2024? My goodness. If you have to argue that in 2024 that 7.3 growth rate don't exist, or that you have to attribute it to growth rate following the pandemic, then in effect what you will have to concede and admit that never ever before in the history of St. Lucia has an economy enjoyed such growth in such a short space of time. Because now you are talking about growth rate in their 20s and possibly reaching their 30s. <laughs> no. That's the predicament of the leader of the opposition. How do you deal with those realities? Nostalgia creeps in sometimes, the speaker. Sometimes. Because when these presentations are made in the House, and I regret I didn't have the opportunity to listen to the leader of the opposition. I really wanted to. Um, we, 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 you know, every, t um, I miss him too often. Too often. I, I would have liked to have listened to him this morning so that we can contest the issues on the merits. But let, let us wait for the policy debate. It, 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 it will be an opportunity um, at the policy debate to contest these ideas. But you know, Mr. Speaker, even if I were to concede some measure of, of credit to the leader of the opposition, I have to take it all back. I'm compelled to take everything back. After all, Mr. Speaker, this opposition is known to be preposterous to engage and employ absurdities in its arguments. And I don't know whether it is a situation that the government is hoping that it could be rescued by its theological outlook, that the truth is what you believe it to be. And maybe that is what is at play, the philosophy, the outlook, that the truth is not really the reality, but what you want to believe it to be. And then, of course, as we have learned over the years and over the months, Mr. Speaker, there are those who, who will accept that kind of logic and drink that kind of logic to their heart's content and delight. The truth is what you believe it to be. And what a predicament for a leader of an opposition to have to answer to those growth rates. And so, Mr. Speaker, there is another element that I want to touch on before I come to the substance of some of the issues. Again, nostalgia, Mr. Speaker, a little bit of nostalgia. And honorable members, I know, will concede the occasional nostalgia in these, in these matters. But I warn you all, those of you who think at my age that quote unquote among elderly, don't make a mistake because there are prime ministers in this region who are older than I am. I have no desire to be prime minister in my life again. I am enjoying my life as it is. It's the most enjoyable period of my life. But this business of believing that these are idiosyncrasies of age, don't make that mistake. Never make that mistake. So a little nostalgia is good for the soul. And from time to time, useful to engage in. I remember, Mr. Speaker, when St. Lucia achieved its first billion dollar budget, and I drew the attention of the then parliament and the people of St. Lucia to the fact that we had crossed a threshold of one billion dollars. I was ridiculed, accused of arrogance, of citing a statistic of no relevance to the daily lives of the people of this country. Day in, day out, and the member for Castries East will remember what I had to endure 
I believe there are two things he remembers, but there are many others remember. This, this declaration of a billion dollar budget. And mind you, there are people in the society who should have known better who engage in that kind of behavior. I watch the society with utter fascination. And you know one of the biggest problems that we have in the society is when we see wrongdoing being committed, we applaud those who do it, and we refuse to correct those who do it, and we are reaping it to the, today. Wrongdoing is everywhere, but we applaud it, and we justify it, and find excuses for it. That's what our life has become. Whether you're on the opposition benches, or whether you're in government, that's the reality. It has become a national culture. We applaud those who say the wrong things, write the wrong things, do the wrong things. And we don't have the guts or temerity to stand up to them and say, this is wrong. So we, we pay a price. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I remember that occasion well. Outstanding people in the society who parroted that garbage rather than understanding what crossing that threshold meant. Today, Mr. Speaker, I am witness to the fact that our budget stands at an estimated $1,894,110,800. This is astounding. This is astounding. And how times have changed, Mr. Speaker. How times have changed. We speak the language of billions of dollars. Mr. Speaker, I accept that the value of money has been eroded substantially. Money has lost a lot of value because of inflation. But I say that even if that is so, it remains a real significant achievement that we have a budget of $1.8 billion. We have come a long way. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, I'm not making any pronouncements, I believe, it's just my own belief, that if this government perseveres, then in two years' time, we will see a budget of $2 billion. That, in my books, Mr. Speaker, will be an achievement if the respective balances remain as healthy as we have indicated in the budget summary. We have, we have come of age. That is it. Now, Mr. Speaker, I do not intend to make today a, a day of a litany of I remember. If I had to, then today I would be on my feet for the entire day. So I ask you to forgive this little nostalgia. But I go back one step. I recall that two years ago, when the Minister of Finance delivered his budgetary statement, in my budget response, I said to the government that the secret to the recovery of the economy in the short term was a significant investment in infrastructure. I don't know whether honorable members recall this. I said that was the key. Recovery, however, should not, cannot and should not be left solely to tourism. Tourism don't have that ability to do so while it may provide you with the kind of statistics and while it can, of course, provide you with the foreign exchange that you need. I am therefore glad that this government has taken steps to declare this year as a year of infrastructure. But Mr. Speaker, decisions like that must have meaning and must have value. The declaration of the year of infrastructure should not mean that this is a year of the declaration of an opportunity for the big contractors. It must not be for the big contractors. It must be for the ordinary citizens, the army of, of masons and laborers and small contractors in our midst. So that whatever, whatever allocations have been made and have been spent, that must be translated to touch the pockets of the small people in this country, 
That is vital so that they can buy in politically, but more importantly, Mr. Ske Spe Mr. Speaker, the impact it is going to have on the downward trend of unemployment in the country. And look, Mr. Speaker, just travel around the country. I can tell you even that East Coast Highway from Castries down to, to Viewfort, we need to build endless drains along the highway. Endless drains along the highway. Put people to work. Let them build and construct these drains to improve that highway that we've been talking about. Put people to work. Put the masons to work. Put them, make them quiet. Let them end the, end the talking and the speculation. And so, Mr. Speaker, I just hope that the Ministry of Infrastructure will understand that the decoration of the year of infrastructure is not for the big contractors only, but it has to be also for the ordinary citizens of this country. And I will say more of this, Mr. Speaker, when I engage in the policy debate. And in that policy debate, I, want, I will want to address the issue of the capacity of the Ministry of Infrastructure to deliver projects, the Ministry's ability to respond to community emergencies, and I also want to look at, in that policy debate, at alternative models of delivery of projects in this country. In other words, what alternative models we can create to allow infrastructure projects to be delivered in, in the country free of the bureaucracy that is so readily apparent in the operations of the Ministry of Agriculture, of infrastructure, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General visited me just before the delivery of this, 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 this statement this afternoon. And he is a man who, Mr. Speaker, is very careful with language and he avoids certain, certain words. But he said enough to say to me that he knows that I'm, a, I'm garrulous. I speak a lot. I say a lot of things. That's what he was trying to tell me this afternoon. So he wanted to be sure that I'm not going to go through one of my moments of been exceedingly talkative and garrulous and say things I should not say. And I want to say to him, as I've said before, I have, and I'm saying this in with all good intention, that I have often reflected, Mr. Speaker, about those parliamentarians who were backbenchers in my time. And sometimes I've wondered whether in my time I paid enough attention to them, to their constituencies. And when I look back, truth be told, both political parties have really not had much historical experience in dealing with backbenchers in our parliament. So this is a learning experience on all sides. And I believe the lessons have to be learned among the backbenchers and also by the government in office. And you see, I'll tell you why too, Mr. Speaker. We are likely and we need to revisit our boundaries, the delimitation of boundaries. And sooner or later, we will have to increase the size of our parliament. What this means translated is that you're going to have more backbenchers in your parliament. You will therefore have to de develop a culture to deal with backbenchers. And I personally believe, Mr. Speaker, that it would be a good thing if in the course of any financial year, if each minister holds a town hall in the constituencies of backbenchers to hear from their constituents, their views on the development of their constituencies, and how best the ministry can assist whatever um, they wish to be done in their constituencies. Now, I don't know if I have disappointed the Attorney General by taking that approach. I understand that, so I understand. So I understand. So I understand. So I don't know whether you want to start learning the initial lessons. I don't know. This gives me just the jumping off point 
to make an observation that I want to expand on. Mr. Speaker, I note the considerable resources being made with the Ministry of Tourism. And I'm referring to Head 47 of the estimates because it discloses that some 3.345 million is allocated to community tourism. This is a respectful allocation, not bad. I believe that the ministry can do it three times that, really, but this is respectful for a start. But what I wanted to tell the Minister of Tourism is that you fortunes want a piece of that pie. That's really where I want to go. In that regard, I want to issue an invitation to the Minister of Tourism to visit, visit us in Beaufort South to tell us how much of that allocation will go to Beaufort South. Mr. Speaker, that's my point. <laughs> you all can cite where you all want to cite, but I know where I want to cite. <laughs> In advance of that visit, I asked the minister to consider financing a consultancy to do a feasibility study on the establishment of a boardwalk alongside the beachfront of the town of UFO, stretching from the fisheries complex in UFO to the fish market, to the existing fish market. And I'll have more to say in a few moments because this becomes important when the fish market is repurposed and revitalized. But I'll have a few more minutes. I'll have to say more of this in a few minutes. The idea of a boardwalk to elevate the frontage of Beaufort is dear to the residents of Beaufort South and will provide new economic and reinvigorated economic opportunities to the people of Beaufort South. And there are so many examples of boardwalks throughout the region that you look at. There's the Barbados model. All we ask at this stage is, where? That? Not to my taste or my liking. But I can introduce you to other boardwalks elsewhere. But at least a consultancy so that we make a start in this regard. I'm also aware, Mr. Speaker, that the lease held by the Williams family of the property once described as the lobster pot has expired. It would be good if the Minister shares his views on how this property is to be developed. And of course, hear from my constituents the ideas about the future potential of this property. I believe that this is a site that is currently going to waste. It is not being utilized. And of course, the good thing is that the property has now reverted to the Crown. And while you fought South is in the focus of the Minister, the question of what is to be done with Mullah Sheikh and his lighthouse deserves attention. Unfortunately, the National Trust, who holds the property, are joining the lighthouse in trust has not been able to come up with any realistic ideas as to how the property can be integrated in the development of the Fort South. And you know, we waste our history, I think. We really do waste our history in this, in, in this country. All we seem to be interested in is sugar mills, old sugar mills. But mind you, I have a sugar mill at Larish. I have two sugar mills, by the way. I have one at Larish Juice and another one down, um, down lower down there on Latuni. And they're respectable sugar mills, you know. But my point is that that area of the lighthouse, Mr. Speaker, was once a tracking station for American missiles, when American missiles were being tested. But that history has gone to waste. The very building that was used is still there, and I will not tell you, Mr. Speaker, what the building is being used for. But I know you're a man of considerable imagination, and I leave it to your imagination to put the pieces together, Mr. Speaker. If you want to be reminded, then do pay a visit at your leisure, Mr. Speaker. 
So these are the issues. And one of the problems that we have, and I'm saying this so that the National Trust can hear me loud and clear, is that when the government of St. Lucia places its patrimony of the people of St. Lucia in the care and protection of the National Trust, the National Trust has to understand it does not mean care and protection in perpetuity that no investment must be introduced abroad to these areas to make use of those of, 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 of those sites or whatever historical remains on those sites. And the National Trust has to get its act together because you cannot hold a constituency in purgatory for so long. It can never be justified. So I want that to resonate with the National Trust. Mr. Speaker, allow me to return to the Ministry of Infrastructure, Transport and Port Services. And I did say to my good friend, the Attorney General, that I wouldn't be saying much in this address. And so it is, I will concentrate on safe ground, my constituency. Mr. Speaker, last year, when I spoke at the estimates debate, I lamented a lack of attention to the roads of your four south. And colleagues will remember that I've done so for three years in a row. I lamented in particular, the plight of the residents of Cedar Heights. I lamented the unpaved section of the Bruceville Main Road. I lamented the failure to complete the paving of the St. Jude Highway and the Larry Seuss Road from the bridge to the Heineken Brewery. I lamented that. And I, I just want, Mr. Speaker, to highlight why those roads are important, quite apart from the fact that it is necessary um, for the citizens to benefit from good roads. But you know, the roads in that area have deteriorated so badly that ordinary motorists on their way to Sozel or to Soufre, who have to go through Vifort, do not use those roads, and rather they use the highway through Vifort, and that is causing some of the congestion that um, exists in, in Vifort at this time. So it is vital that the roads be repaired. And while the Ministry of Infrastructure is thinking about re repairing roads, I must say I probably have the lousiest roundabout in this country. Probably the worst roundabout in this country. You Nick. Well then take it to Library and put it up on the top of <laughs> on the top of Library Hill to, and you tell me if it's unique on the hill up there. Take it to like you you're shouting no 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 fast. <laughs> Come to think of it, Baldy Black's a good place for it. Come to think of it. And while this ministry is talking about all these fancy roundabouts, I'm going to invite the Minister of Infrastructure to look at a roundabout in Viewfort, <laughs> at the top of New Dock Road. Viewfortians don't deserve this. And I wish I could tell you the number of times I have dialogued with the Ministry of Infrastructure about replacing that roundabout. That's the roundabout that carries the flag of St. Lucia around independence. <laughs> and this is your second turn, you know, Mr. Speaker. This is your second town, and it is being treated that way. So, Mr. Speaker, we have opportunities to make use of the talents in the Ministry of Infrastructure. While these roads are not itemized in the Capital Works Program of the Ministry under Head 43, there is reason for optimism this year. When the minister reeled off the um, impressive number of roads constructed in other constituencies, I say, hey, that's it. I must be on the list. I heard him talk about a number of roads in Fort North. I heard him talk about a number of roads in Grosile. Then I heard him even talk about Austin Hill in, in Denry North. I said, bound to be now. 
I said, bound to be not this year. Bound to be not this year. And then I heard the announcement, Mr. Speaker. I heard the announcement this year that, and listen to the words of the, not his direct words, but the imputation was clear, that Viewfort South was shortchanged when the St. Jude Highway was only constructed to the brewery and nothing else was done and St. Jude Highway remained as is, the resource remained as is, and therefore attention will be given to these roads. I also heard him say that Cedar Heights will be given attention. And Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you why I am optimistic. I am optimistic, and I'm going to use, again, a phrase that we have used in the political lexicon of our parliament. And those who are in this parliament, will, if followed it when you are younger, and will remember this phrase. No, 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 no. A phrase where a famous parliamentarian, I believe it was the then Deputy Prime Minister, Sir George Mallet, he stood up and announced that as we speak, construction is on the way. You remember? Now tell me which project it was. Borderley. No, no, no. It wasn't Borderley, but it was a prison, a new prison. As we speak, lo and behold, no prison was ever being constructed, but as we speak, today, I am honored to use the, fr the phrase, as we speak, to say that as we speak, construction is on the way in Cedar Heights. And that the road named Calabas Street is currently under repairs. As we speak. <laughs> the Minister of Infrastructure has hope for redemption. <laughs> there is hope for redemption. Because as we speak, this road is under, under construction. And I now await, Mr. Speaker, attention to the other roads to bring relief to the residents of Cedar Heights who have had to suffer so much over the years. And Mr. Speaker, I told you at the last sitting that repetition is a very good thing. Remember that, Mr. Speaker? Glad you remember that, Mr. Speaker. I told you, Mr. Speaker, that repetition is an important tool of all good teachers. It's also It's also against? It's also not, no, we will have a different interpretation of the standing orders, Mr. Speaker. And it is only so if there's repetition in one contribution, not in successive contributions over a period of time. So, you see, you can see fair enough. That's an important step, Mr. Speaker. My point, um, Mr. Speaker, is this, that we have to do something about completing the Bruceville Road the top of the Bruceville Road, from Bruceville to the main road. The people of Bruceville, despite all their woes, despite their troubles, their pains, they have stood by me and stood by this government year in, year out. No community has been as heavily bribed as you thought as Bruceville to vote against me. And no community has accepted the bribes to the extent that they have and have repeatedly voted for me despite the bribes. And your representative, Mr. Speaker, always tell the people of Bruceville, they come to you, they give you money, take it. Let me know how much they give you, but take it. That's the investment that has been put into that. Now, Mr. Speaker, I am not going to go into the issue of whether they were bribed on election day or not. I'm not going to go there. I'm talking about bribery in general. So, Mr. Speaker, they deserve the day in the sun. Now, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I think Tuesday, Mr. Speaker, was interesting. The Minister of Finance made reference to plans to construct an entertainment center for the Vivot South. You recall, Mr. Speaker, I feigned surprise, I expressed some surprise. 
And I know my friend to my right wants to find out about this entertainment center of, and what is this entertainment center that is coming to, to, um, to, to view for it. You see, Mr. Speaker, the former administration in its tenure had in fact announced plans for an investment group from Trinidad and Tobago to construct a cinema complex and entertainment center for Viewfort South. That project, I mean, never materialized. So when the Minister of Finance mentioned this entertainment center, I said, don't tell me that project is resurfacing. Um, because the plan was to use the area designated for an administrative center um, for this for the so-called complex. Mercifully, it didn't materialize. But I'm glad that better use was made of the lands in Dufort. And I now notice that the, a parcel of land made available to Brian ahead has been cleaned. And I understand that a mall and other facilities will be constructed in that area, which is a far more purposeful use of, of the land. So that, that is a welcome, welcome development. And I am happy that it is a Beaufortian who is making that kind of investment in that kind, that, that kind of... And let me say this to this Honorable House. When you look at Beaufort and the history of Beaufort, and I'm telling you this so you can understand Beaufort because the psychology of Beaufortians are not understood. Modern day Beaufort was not constructed by merchants and investors from castries or from the north, you know. Modern day Viewfort, what it is today, was done by Viewfortians. They are the ones who have developed the infrastructure, put up the buildings, and engage in business in Viewfort, not the merchants in the north. That's, 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 that is the, the big difference, Mr. Speaker. So, an investment by the Daher family is certainly welcome. But you could well imagine, Mr. Speaker, since the announcement by the Minister of Finance on Tuesday, I have been bombarded with calls from constituents. All anxious for details. Some want to, to know if there was the possibility for them to invest or if there were new economic opportunities that they too can participate in. So, I had to meander somewhat, Mr. Speaker. But then, I subsequently realized, after discussions with the Minister of Finance, what he had in mind, and really what he was describing. And, of course, this is a project that I welcome, I have championed, and I am looking forward to because it has the potential to, catal to catalyze. What the Minister of Finance meant was a project to repurpose, revitalize, and transform the existing GA4 market into a venue for cultural performances and fine dining experience. Let me explain what the concept is. And I have, Mr. Speaker, the attention of the member for Sozel um, Solibus because he was dying to know um, what this project um, is all about. Mr. Speaker, I see looking at the clock. How many minutes I have? 18? 1 8, Mr. Speaker? Okay, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker! Like many um, community marketplaces throughout the world, Mr. Speaker, the whole market in the town of Beaufort many years ago was emblematic of the vibrancy of the old town of Beaufort. And some of us can remember on Saturdays going to Beaufort town and going by the old market. I mean, the level of business activity was extraordinary. One of the best markets in the world. And the, well, I mean in the region, sorry. And Mr. Speaker, the tragedy was that once the town moved northwards and the area, area on New Dock Road and Latuni was developed, then commerce moved north. Really. And that has been the challenge of the 
old Beaufort town. Everything moved north. Banks moved north. Services moved north. Restaurants moved, moved north. Businesses moved north. The result of this is that SNS. SMS, SNS didn't move south. That's another story, but we'll talk about that. So, Mr. Speaker, that really was the, the reality. And there have been numerous efforts, Mr. Speaker, to try to revitalize that, that part of the, of, of, of the town. It would be a monumental tragedy if the old market was left on its own just to decay and to, to waste away. And uh, given what has happened, Mr. Speaker, the fact that business and economic activity have moved to Clark Street and to the New Dock area, we have had to find a solution to bring some life and energy to that part of the town. Mr. Speaker, what is proposed is that the old Viewfort market is repurposed. It calls for a combination of restoration and the installation of new features to both rekindle the nostalgia of the venue, Mr. Speaker, in its original intent, while adding new commercial value in gentrifying both the venue and immediate environments. So it is, the intention is, is to allow it to become not just a market, but as a site for cultural performances and indeed a fine dining tourism venue. And I'm happy that technical assessments have been made and it, in a sense this is an interesting idea, an imaginative proposal to transform the market, to bring it to life. And when I spoke to the Minister of Tourism to say to him to explore by consultancy the possibility of a boardwalk for before, the whole idea was to connect the fisheries complex by a boardwalk to a boardwalk that will be built just outside of the old market as part of that dining, um, dining experience. Again, the member for Labry is watching and listening intently. <laughs> you see, I have great love, respect, and admiration for Labry. Really great love, admiration, respect. I mean, it was my base when I went to school at the secondary school. But, and I know the member for Labry has persevered in building a market in Labry. I, I sometimes wonder what he tells his cabinet colleagues because every other word he uses is probably saying library market, library market, library market, library market. While the member for Denver North says Austin Hill, Austin Hill, he, re he replies library market, library market, library market. And you know, he suffered under the tenure of the former government. Not his, even his friend Bradley was able to save him because the fellows canceled his market. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. The oral members canceled his market. So now he's going back to the basics and he's building his market. But I said all of this to say that the Viewfort proposal, albeit that it is a proposal to ex design an existing structure is far more imaginative than what is going to be constructed in library. <laughs> the member knows nothing about the concept of a boardwalk. And he can't. And I want to assure the government of St. Lucia that the money that will be expended on that project in Dufort will nowhere come close to the cost of the, of the market in library. Nowhere, but that's the reality. Sometimes you have possibilities that far exceed the expectations of individuals. So, Mr. Speaker, this new facility will be able to facilitate multiple vendors by design. It will provide new restaurant, dining, and entertainment infrastructure. It will introduce new value added, such as merchandising and social media connectivity all under one thematic concept. 
It will be augmented with installed landscaping, stylized lighting and dining infrastructure for cafe, daytime and evening cuisine, along with repurposed entertainment areas and ancillary structures, including front of house and backstage, all without altering the existing structure of the market. And as I said, there will be a boardwalk. Now, Mr. Speaker, as you can see, the overarching goal of this project is not only to re-establish the old Viewfort market as a viable cultural and commercial space, but to use my words to reinvigorate, reinvigorate and gentrify that quarter of the town, hopefully to reorient it to a back to town experience and that it can be seen as a potential tourism waterfront. Now, Mr. Speaker, consider all what you are getting, and uh, I am advised... Remember, you have 10 minutes left. I am advised, Mr. Speaker, subject to your admonition, that the total cost of this project is just $1.5, Mr. Speaker, million dollars. Just $1.5 million. Easy, Mr. Speaker. Inexpensive, Mr. Speaker. It worries me, Mr. Speaker. $1.5 million, $1.581 is the estimated cost. Now, let me enter a caveat. Mr. Speaker, this project is not an excuse for providing Viewfort with an administrative complex. It is not an excuse. The administrative complex is designed, among other things, not only to provide government offices and space, but also to give you fortunes, the second town in this country, a theater that they have long been denied. So it is a temporary facility to reinvigorate that part of the town of Euphort, but it is not an excuse not to construct the administrative complex that the people of Euphort have been asking for over. Oh, I say no more, Mr. Speaker. I leave it there. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to touch very briefly on two other sectors, because time is of essence. Mr. Speaker, connected to the Viewfort market of fisheries complex, the, flight, the plight of our uh, fisher folk in Viewfort South, and I draw attention to Head 41 at page 628. Mr. Speaker, an allocation of $850,000 has been made for, quote, repairs to fishing facilities. I know that of that of this amount, a sum will be spent to undertake urgent repairs to a leaking storage container, which needs, I understand, to be properly housed. Additionally, a new perimeter fence will be installed and repairs will be undertaken to the boat landing strips on the slipway or ramps. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is welcome news. And Mr. Speaker, I had to turn to my neighbor, my colleague to my left, the member for Denry North, South. for Denry South, and I had to whisper to him, am I going to get these facilities this year? I say yes. He assured me that this year, these projects will be done. And make this declaration in this house. And I hope that the younger members of parliament understand what it means when a declaration is made in the <laughs> parliament of St. Lucia. I hope they understand. When he said yes to me, I turned around and whispered to him, Comrade, similar announcements were made for the past two years. I believe we understand each other, so I say no more. <laughs> and I believe that the Minister of Finance has heard me. I believe that other members have heard me. And I believe that the Honourable, Honourable Member understands that there will be a judgment day <laughs> when pronouncements will come. But the fishers of before South 
will be relieved. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that this is in addition to other initiatives which were announced yesterday by the member for Sufra in her capacity as the minister responsible for commerce. Mr. Speaker, I am also very pleased by the initiatives that are on the way in respect of school infrastructure. I am yet to hear what will be done with the roof of the former junior secondary school next to Kimatri. It's a matter that merits some discussion. But I welcome in particular the indication that there is a new block which will be constructed for the Plainview School and that the repairs will be undertaken to the science block at the Beaufort Senior Secondary. I welcome, welcome those initiatives. May I, however, say to the Minister that as much as those initiatives are necessary and as much as they're welcome, and Plainview is one of our top performing schools, they deserve it. I want to strongly urge that electrical consultants be engaged to undertake a consultancy about the electricity services at the Beaufort Senior Secondary Public. I hate to say it, Mr. Speaker, but I fear a major accident. And I want to urge the Minister to take the first step this year to find some money somewhere and let a major electrical firm carry out an assessment of the entire block because of the five minutes left member of this matter. Mr. Speaker, if I did not know you better, I would say to you that you are complicit. You want me to end prematurely. But I know better, Mr. Speaker, that your integrity will never allow you to say that, Mr. Speaker. Okay, you and you too must defend the standing order. And in and out of the chair, I too must defend the standing order. <laughs> but let me say, Mr. Speaker, let me say, Mr. Speaker, you know, no set of estimates, Mr. Speaker, can ever be perfect. None whatsoever. It is impossible. It is impossible. After all, why on earth would you describe it as estimates of revenue and expenditure? Why would you use that, that description, estimates of revenue and expenditure? In the mind of the ordinary citizen, this is gospel. This, this, everything here is gospel. But it's not gospel. It is an estimate. And to use the, the, the words of a, a very distinguished permanent secretary, estimates are no more than statements or expressions of intentions, unquote. Now, I bet you all don't know which permanent secretary said that. No, not at all. Who? No, 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 no. It's not that imaginative. <laughs> Guess again, which permanent secretary in the pantheon of permanent secretaries in St. Lucia could say that? Your bear was too clinical for that. Right? Nah. Right lacks imagination. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> You're a banker. You lack, huh? Those words were uttered by none other than, than Mr. George Theophilus when he was pressed as permanent secretary as to why certain commitments made by the then John Compton government were not honored. And then he made this pronouncement that, you know, estimates are no more than statements or expressions of intention. John Compton was furious. So John Compton, I might add, was furious and lambasted George Theophilus for making what was clearly was an obvious statement. Now I see your hand, Mr. Speaker, pondering, wondering if I am correct. I can assure you, I am correct. But the Sir John Compton, you know, would understand why. You would understand why he would be 
most annoyed at such a statement because it then goes to the issue of credibility of honoring what you say in Parliament but then we deal with reality in my view Mr. Speaker while these estimates are not perfect they are sound Mr. Speaker they are focused and let me add Mr. Speaker they are realistic they are reasonable and they are well structured I applaud the Minister of Finance if there is any criticism and this is me speaking it is that the estimates are unduly conservative in its approach but I concede that we may well need this approach for the times that we are in I concede that and in my time I have been known for some unusual approaches to constructing estimates and there's it's not a weakness that an estimate a book of estimates bearing only intentions can of course adopt conservative postures mr speaker as i close i know that our country will face some headwinds the minister of finance will face some headwinds mr speaker some of these headwinds clearly we have to leave for the policy debate I know for example the likely fate of the CIP program is a headwind I know to the continued shock of petroleum prices is another headwind the high cost of energy in St. Lucia is, a, is, is, is another major headwind and still another and the one we don't want to talk about the challenge of revenue generation to meet the rising cost of providing services to our people and to finance their needs these are major headwinds that we will have to address in the months ahead I plan as I said Mr. Speaker to reserve my comments on these matters for the policy review. suffice it to say Mr. Speaker in closing I merely look forward to an interesting and fascinating policy debate. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.